YouTube has had over a trillion Minecraft videos on the platform alone, which I hope doesn't hurt this video's chances of doing well, but I guess we'll see. Which I hope doesn't hurt this video's chances of doing well, but I guess we'll see. Which I hope doesn't hurt this video's chances of doing well, but I guess we'll see. Which I hope doesn't hurt this video's chances of doing well, but OH MY GOODNESS! Well, goddamn, you guys did not disappoint. Before this video begins, I just wanted to quickly thank you guys for checking out my last video on Minecraft. I appreciate all the views, all the likes, everybody who subscribed, and especially all the people who commented on it. I got so much positive and constructive feedback, so many people sharing with me stories of their own playthrough. I read every single one of those comments, and let me tell you, just seeing those pop up on my phone over the course of the past two weeks has just been a massive serotonin boost to my brain, so I don't know what else to say, but thank you guys. So, <laughs> at the risk of throwing that all away, Minecraft Story Mode. This guy's face really says it all. So a few years after the initial release of Minecraft, they started making side games, with Minecraft Story Mode being the first. And apparently the most popular, judging by the poll that I put out a little while back. For me, I never played this game before. I mean, what kind of person would I be if I played Minecraft Story Mode before the main game? A fucking psycho. I have, however, played a couple of games developed by Telltale Games before, so I had a good idea of what I was getting myself into. I played The Walking Dead in the first two chapters of The Wolf Among Us, so I think it's pretty safe to say I'm an expert on this genre and my word should be taken as the gospel here. But before I ruin whatever good relationship I have with the Minecraft fanbase, let's talk about how this game sort of manifested itself out of the ether. Around the early 2010s, there was a newfound interest in these narrative adventure style games that seemed to be taking a lot of influence from the point and click style adventure games of the 90s. Your Monkey Islands, Mists, and Sam and Maxes led the charge at the time for games to be a lot more narratively focused, with the gameplay taking a back seat in favor of light puzzle solving in order to experience the next piece of the story. Two studios were really responsible for the updated take on this formula, Quantic Dream with the likes of Fahrenheit, Beyond Two Souls, and of course Heavy Rain and the studio will be focusing on today, Telltale Games, with their works on Back to the Future, The Walking Dead, and The Wolf Among Us. See, while Quantic was more interested in creating their own IPs, Telltale was often using licensed materials to craft their worlds. They would go on to release another Walking Dead game and an adaptation of Game of Thrones before finally making their jump into using another video game property with Tales of the Borderlands. It was during this time that the idea of doing more with video game worlds came about. The game at the top of their list, Minecraft which is a bit of an interesting idea seeing as how there was technically no story in Minecraft, or characters, or even any guaranteed events in general, really. This apparently excited Telltale with how open this prospect was, and they could do essentially whatever they wanted to with this world. Telltale knew that fan-generated content was huge for Minecraft at the time, and drew inspiration from that, plus things that happened within their own private server while they were playing. Unlike a lot of their contemporary work, Telltale really went back to their point-and-click roots with this one, given the family-friendly nature of the IP. All the dark themes of sex, violence, and substance abuse were replaced with jokes and characters that wouldn't be out of place in an early morning Nickelodeon cartoon. The game was officially shown off at MineCon 2015, where it was revealed to be releasing in an episodic fashion, very much like other Telltale games at the time. All of the Minecraft Story Mode episodes were released between October of 2015 and September of 2016, with a collection featuring all the episodes together, releasing to 7th and 8th gen consoles in October of 2016, followed by some ports to the Wii U in December, and to the Switch in August of 2017. The game was released on basically everything under the sun, and it was... Um, well, people played it. Kinda. Getting to the scores for this one, kind of a pain in the ass given its episodic nature. Most scored in between the high 60s and low 70s, with a few critics grading the overall package in that same range. Nintendo Life gave the collection a 7 and was quoted as saying, In short, Minecraft Story Mode The Complete Adventure is a worthwhile ride, though it is a bit inconsistent in terms of the quality of the episodes. While website Cubed 3 gave the game a less positive 6 and said, If it was not for the amusing script, well-realized Minecraft setting, likable characters, and moderately engaging storylines, 
then this would have been an unmitigated disaster as Telltale continues to take the point and click genre in a direction that no point and click fan wants. Ouch. Can't say I totally disagree though, more on that in a minute. I couldn't really find some concrete sales numbers for this one, which is understandable given the episodic nature of the title, as well as being released on nearly everything under the sun, as well as another big event that I'll talk about in a second. But from what I've heard, this game underperformed by quite a bit. And when it came to accolades, I also couldn't find a whole lot on this one either, outside of a few nominations from the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards, which it lost to Just Dance. Take that for what you will. It doesn't end there, however, as Minecraft Story Mode also received a second season in 2017, which was received just about as well as the first season. And in June of 2018, it was announced that Telltale would begin porting their games over to Netflix, with Minecraft Story Mode being the first edition. In late fall of 2018, Telltale revealed their bankruptcy-related issues and that the studio would be shutting down. This essentially left a skeleton crew to complete the transition to Netflix and the game being delisted on all storefronts in June of 2019, with each of the episodes no longer being available for download, even if purchased prior. Licensing rights was a scapegoat given, and in the lead-up to the delisting, the episodes on the Xbox Marketplace were priced up to $100 each to quote-unquote deter players. <laughs> sure. The deal with Netflix wouldn't last long though, as the game was also removed from there in December of 2022. So with all that being said, this makes Minecraft Story Mode completely unavailable unless you are able to find a physical copy for sale, or... You are a pirate! <laughs> and because I couldn't find a great source for that second option, I had to scour some local game stores to find this baby right here. And if you ignore the disgusting price tag and the fact that someone chewed on the spine, you've got yourself a game that, if I'm going to be fully honest, really wasn't worth the time it took me to find a copy. Alright, so quick synopsis before we get into the meat of this video. Minecraft Story Mode, it's... Alright. I said, alright. This game doesn't necessarily do anything super bad, like, don't get me wrong, some of the writing is cringe. Chicken! 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 Oh! It's gone. You're totally fine. You're a totally cool dude. Okay, most of the writing is cringe. And the story really isn't all that interesting, and a lot of the characters are pretty lame or annoying. It does have some fun meta ideas for some plot points, but the real sin this game commits is that it's so boring. If this game isn't actively giving me embarrassing dialogue, it's causing my eyes to glaze over because nothing is happening. Telltale games have never been known for their exciting gameplay, but they do occasionally have segments with legitimate tension or tough decisions to be made. I did not get that in this game at all given how low the stakes actually were and how little my choices ultimately mattered. And the story, while not bad, is just a slog to get through because the lack of material spread out over the course of eight whole episodes, which is the most out of any Telltale game. I'll get into some more detail as the video goes on, but I'm going to be very forthcoming with you guys on this one. I think this game is mostly skippable. To some, it's a very fun, nostalgic experience, and hey, you could definitely grow up with worse. I grew up with this. But to me, this game is just sort of okay. It's incredibly inoffensive, very safe, with nothing really doing much to keep me interested outside of a few notable moments. I should also mention that I'm pretty much only going to be focusing on the first season, as well as the DLC content in this episode. I truly could not find a physical version of the second season to save my life, so here we are. We got a lot to cover today, so without further ado, this is my review of Minecraft Story Mode. Let's start this review off with something positive, which is actually the scenery. From my understanding, every single scene in Minecraft Story Mode was actually hand-created in Minecraft before being ported over to Telltale to animate, meaning pretty much every set that you see the characters run through in this game can be recreated in Minecraft proper. I think that is really cool, not only for building purposes in my own game, but it's also remarkable with how many different environments Telltale were able to craft given what Minecraft was like nearly a decade ago. Like, some of the structures they built were massive, and they all did a really great job of making you feel like you were really in these unique locales. I also love all the little nods to Minecraft visuals, like the hearts that appear on screen during the combat segments, the way characters jump up blocks, and the way people blink red when they're damaged, even if it doesn't always consistently happen. What I don't like are the way that these characters look and how they're animated. I'll come out and say it. I think some of the characters in this game are flat out ugly, and they look like bad fan creations. Like, most of the main characters are okay, but shit, just look at Axel's stupid fucking unibrow. Or how about this green lantern wannabe? 
or God, whenever anybody gives that shit-eating grin during dialogue, they look like Shaquille O'Neal trying to sell you something. You can't mess with perfection, but you can moisturize it. That's where a lot of my issues with animation actually is. These characters, if standing still, look like they could maybe be custom Minecraft skins, but when they move, they have more fluid animation than anything you'd see in a game of Minecraft. They move their limbs in a way that you'd never see in the standard game. They blink and have multiple different expressions. They have flashy as fuck fight scenes for some reason, but then they also combine that with traditional Minecraft animations, such as mining, building, eating food, or jumping up blocks. What this does is give the game a very inconsistent style of animation between wanting to appeal to Minecraft fans while also being more visually interesting, but given the blocky nature, it still limits how fluid those animations can actually be. Now in a game like Minecraft, where you never see your character and only occasionally see other people, that's fine and it adds to the charm a little bit. In this game, where you're watching it from a third person perspective, it somehow manages to be both incredibly inconsistent and also uninteresting to look at. Speaking of uninteresting, let's talk about the audio design. Let's start with maybe my least favorite thing, the voice acting. For as star-studded as this cast is, the voice acting is very inconsistent. You have some standout lead performances with Ashley Johnson as Petra and the late Paul Rubens as Ivor, and some decent supporting one-off performances from Matt Mercer, Jim Cummings, Ashley Birch. Hell, they even got angelic to the core Corey Feldman here. I can't believe he wasn't busy. Pretty much everyone else seems to be just wanting to collect a paycheck because there is little to no emotion behind any of these performances. Patton Oswalt, Scott Porter, Brian Posehn, I know these guys are great voice actors, but they just sound so bored reading their lines as I was listening to them. Prismarine is such a cool word. Prismarine. Very, very bored. The audio design isn't all bad though. For fans of Minecraft, you could definitely be prepared to hear familiar noises from placing blocks to the multiple mob noises, but one notable thing missing from this game when it comes to audio is Minecraft's OST. You had one of the best soundtracks in gaming history and couldn't bring back anything for the next entry in the series? Granted, the soundtrack in this game is actually pretty decent in its own right. Antimo and Wells did a great job, and I think some stuff such as Ivor's theme and Lapis Lazuli really could fit into the Minecraft soundtrack and no one would bat an eye, but some of the other pieces I don't think mesh nearly as well with the rest of the soundtrack. They're good for background noise or maybe just for this game, but they aren't exactly something that stands out in my mind. That being said, when you have an OST of over 100 songs, there are bound to be some forgettable pieces, so I think this one gets a pass from me. So as is the title of the game, the big appeal behind this one is of course a story, but how do you take a game that's as open-ended as Minecraft and condense that down to a cohesive plot? Well, Telltale found a way for better or for worse. The story starts with a flashback to a group of heroes to the Order of the Stone who defeated the Ender Dragon a long time ago. It is implied that these heroes are actually the characters from the player's playthrough of Minecraft, but this game has gone ahead and given them their own personalities. Gabriel the bravado-filled warrior, Soren the leader, Eligard the genius redstone engineer, and Magnus a griefer bet on destruction. In the present day we meet our main characters Jesse, a guy with no personality, Olivia, a girl with no personality, and Axel, a guy who has a personality that I wish he didn't have. There's also Jesse's pet pig Ruben, who serves as comic relief and to give the game a cutesy mascot. They're heading over to a festival called Endercon in order to win a chance to meet Gabriel from the Order of the Stone. During their time at Endercon, they meet with the Ocelot, a gang that makes Team Rocket look like the Yakuza. They are led by a guy named Lucas. So why don't we just forget about all this and, you know, make this about how cool our builds are? Lucas is a pussy. Your team decides what to build, and Aiden, the most annoying member of the Ocelot, gets upset and lets out some lava to destroy your build, burning Ruben in the crossfire. Jesse sets out to find Ruben, gets surrounded by mobs, and gets saved by Petra, a local adventurer who I think Jesse may have some eyes for. You better be able to make the Minecraft characters fuck in this game. She convinces Jesse to help her sell a wither skull to a client of hers, but the deal goes south after this Rasputin looking motherfucker Ivor scams Petra by giving her lapis lazuli instead of the promised diamonds. The group finds a way to the mating hall where Gabriel is, and then head down to the basement where they find Ivor's secret lair. 
They found a ton of various things, but the scary thing is an incomplete of Wither when they are suddenly ambushed by Ivor, who summons an Iron Golem to attack them. The group runs upstairs, considers going back downstairs to save Lucas since he was left behind, and by consider, I mean I chuckled at the thought of helping him and carried on with my day. As the group explains to Gabriel what is happening, Ivor summons the Wither with a command block on his chest. It seems that Ivor was looking to control the Wither and kill it after it was summoned in order to become famous like the Order of the Stone. The plan does not work when the command block stops responding and the Wither grows in size, becoming the Wither Storm. The group makes an escape before the Wither Storm begins to suck up both Petra and Gabriel. After picking who to save, Gabriel will give the player an amulet and tell them to take it to the Temple of the Order of the Stone to find the other members. After a quick romp through the nether, we come to the overworld and decide to build a shelter for the night. This gives us plenty of chances to be a dick to Lucas. Oh, what's that, Lucas? You're starving to death in the corner? Too bad, bitch. There's only enough cookies for four of us, and the pig is higher up in the pecking order than you. In fact, I think you look better outside in the rain. See you later, you fucking loser. Oh, he just comes back in the morning to forgive you no matter what. Okay. Moving on, we eventually get to the top of the temple and are given a choice between traveling with Olivia to find Elvigard or with Axel to find Magnus. Since I'd rather gouge my own ears out with a scalpel than listen to another second of Axel's himbo dialogue, I'm gonna go with Olivia. So we go find Elgard, help her make a command block, the Wither Storm destroys everything, and we regroup with the rest of the party. This is where we learn about a weapon that Soren has been working on that's even stronger than TNT. The Formidabomb. Yeah, 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 I've heard all about the F-bomb before. F-bomb? Yeah. Soren claimed that dropping the F-bomb could destroy anything. He means fuck. The group sets out to find Soren in his fortress, where upon arrival, Elgard and Magnus get into an argument and go their separate ways. Whoever you saved earlier between Petra and Gabriel confines in you that they have the wither sickness and don't know what the long-term effects are. They do this right before a creeper blows open a path to a secret laboratory where they have another confrontation with Ivor. Ivor makes his escape by hitting the group with a slowness potion, and that's the end of chapter 2. After the potion's effects wear off, the group accidentally digs into a massive mob farm of all things. Huh, maybe I was wrong about farms in my Minecraft video. They then find an end portal and take it to where they see Soren going into his end base. They follow him through an entire area made of wool, um, sure, and up into a secret lab where we see that he's been studying the behaviors of Endermen. We don an Enderman disguise. The Nigachin! Kinda stinky, but it fits. Ugh, more than kinda stinky, I'm sorry to say. Way to ruin my joke and then solve a puzzle only to be knocked out by Soren. The Endermen are in a frenzy though, and we leave the base by flooding the whole thing in what I must assume must be a hurricane-style catastrophe for the Endermen people. After arriving back in the overworld, the group uses the Formidabomb on the Witherstorm, killing the beast for about five seconds before it splits apart into two identical copies, and we flee the scene with a friend that we didn't save earlier, now suffering from amnesia. Oh, and either Magnus or Eligard dies. Whoops. Everyone else escapes on horseback to come up with a new plan. We eventually meet up with Ivor, who tells us we can enchant a weapon at his base in the Far Lands in order to destroy the command block. Ah, this is kind of cool, checking out a world design quirk and making it a mystical area. I like it. As the group travels through Soren's fortress, they find a number of artifacts that the Order of Stone used to have. After seeing an Ender Crystal that was still intact, which Soren claimed to have destroyed them all, we learn the Order's dark secret. Ivor actually used to be the fifth member of the Order, and he left after they used the command block to delete the Ender Dragon from existence, essentially in cheating their way to victory. I have to say, all of this sort of meta plot points are honestly incredibly interesting. Like this, the mob farms, the far lands being a thing, all of the redstone contraptions that were definitely community creations. There's a lot of attention to detail in these areas, and I think this is an excellent way to pay homage to those parts of the Minecraft community while making it fit into this game's world. We'll see a couple more examples of this later on, but just know no matter what I say about this game's story, this is really an ingenious way to add this into the plot. So, Jesse crafts his weapon of choice, I chose the diamond hoe because of memes, and we take the fight to the Wither Storm. We fight off a number of tentacles, Ruben takes a shot for Jesse before Jesse delivers the final blow, killing the Wither Storm. On the ground, all of our main characters are celebrating the feat of the Wither Storm, but something doesn't seem quite right. Where's Ruben? Oh no. Okay, this has got to be one of those gags where he plays hurt and gets right back up and he's fine, right? No, 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 not the sad pig noises. Come on, Ruben, get up. Ruben, please get up. You are the only character I could tolerate. Please get up. 
Ruben. Why? No, Ruben. No, 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 no. Ruben. What the fuck? Why was that so sad? It's just a stupid pig. Why did they have to make that such a gut punch of a scene? Jesus Christ. And then holy fuck, having him turn into a pork chop? What? <laughs> This is legitimately one of the funniest things I've ever seen in a video game. They did not mean for this to happen. I don't know what else to say. Let's just move on. So that's the story of Minecraft Story Mode. Except not quite. We've only finished episodes 4 out of 8. I don't know what else there is to really go over with this story. I thought things ended pretty conclusively. Well, chapters 5 through 8 actually take on an almost anthology-like style approach with a loose thread tying each of them together. Essentially, Jesse finds an enchanted flint and steel that can open up portals to other worlds, and you end up doing various things and collecting certain objects. For these episodes, you mainly bring along Petra, Ivor, and Lucas. I guess he just likes the abuse. Episode 5 sees our group travel up to the skies to find something called the Eversource. This turns out to be the thing that creates all the spawn eggs, and our heroes get captured after building illegally, and has a showdown with the former Ocelot gang. Honestly, this episode was a little bit on the boring side, but it was kind of funny throwing Aiden off of the edge of the world. Episode 6 is set in this creepy mansion where they come across something they have never encountered before. Something truly terrifying. Something that no one should ever have to see in their entire lives. Minecraft YouTubers. My Stacy plays LD Shadow Lady, Dan TDM, Stampy Cat, and of course Captain Sparkles are all here in a Who Done It style game of Guess Who as we attempt to solve a murder that happened shortly after we arrived. Honestly, YouTuber cameos aside, I like this episode. I think mysteries are a large part of this genre's roots, and it's where these types of games excel at. So I thought this episode was pretty good for the most part. I mean, the person who actually is the killer is always the same, and there isn't anything you could do to catch them early, but still, I don't mind this episode. Even the YouTuber performances, I think, are fine. And if anything, we could take solace in the fact that this game came out at the time it did, because if it came out a few years later, you just know they would have to include Dream or some shit, which might make this one of the worst things ever created by the human race. Episode 7, I'm not gonna lie, I kinda like this one too. You meet a giant redstone computer named Pama, which again, is a really good community reference, and you essentially have to stop it from trying to assimilate everything. This one has a fun premise, an interesting section controlling some mobs. Yeah, I like this one too. The last episode has us starting in a spleef arena in this Hunger Games style of setup. This episode is also surprisingly good, and it has some fun villains, great community references, and an interesting setting. This is all before it ends on a cliffhanger for all of our main characters looking for more adventures. Honestly, after playing the last four episodes, this game should have just been an anthology series. Like, the first four episodes aren't necessarily bad, but it feels like a lot of the ideas are just hit or miss, and they're drawn out over the first four episodes. I didn't really care about the Order of the Stone until I found out they were cheaters, because that is actually funny and interesting on a meta level. It's when they start playing around with the community actions and creations and fitting them into their own storyline, that's where I think the story for this game really shines. There's a lot of potential here, and I know I haven't played the second season of this game, but I have to say I am curious to see if they follow up with more of those concepts. What I can't get over though is this game's awful characters and it's piss poor writing. These characters are mostly a personality black hole. Some people like Ivor really do some heavy lifting of hamming it up in every scene where everyone else could not be bothered to give a shit. The jokes they tell are awful. They rarely show any form of emotion and the dialogue is incredibly inconsistent. A couple examples that come to mind are in Chapter 1, when exploring Ivor's lab, Axel suggests they steal some shit to help them out, while Petra scolds him for doing so. Sure, makes sense. Literally, the very next time you speak to Petra, less than a minute later, she is stealing one of his golden swords. Like, what the fuck is that? Or how about when Soren doesn't want his Endermen to be harmed, mere minutes after you flooded the entire end base, drowning hundreds of them? Does everybody in here suffer from short-term memory loss? Like, oops, I completely forgot what my moral compass was. Or, oops, I completely forgot that we committed mass genocide on this group of Endermen. Like, how do you fuck this up? 
It goes even beyond that though, because most of the problems that these characters face are completely contrived and can easily be figured out by anyone who's ever played Minecraft before. Hell, sometimes they solve problems earlier on in the story that they can easily replicate the results later for, but they just don't for one reason or another. Play through this game and count how many situations Jesse could have gotten himself out of if he simply placed five blocks up to get away from the mobs. Or how about how many times he was stuck somewhere and could easily mine his way out? Or how about the number of times characters needed to get across something that they could have easily built a bridge for? I get it, the game would have been incredibly boring if players were able to do the same solution over and over again, but in the context of this game's narrative, it makes no goddamn sense. Like in a life or death situation, why does Jesse not mine behind him and fill the walls with dirt just to keep himself safe here? What is stopping Jesse from mining through this door where he knows there's an entrance to the other side? Why can't Jesse just build a bridge across this maze so he doesn't have to navigate the whole thing? Why do I need to unleash water on these Endermen to keep them away when we already had a segment in the same episode where we saw we could easily get by them as long as we made no eye contact? This shit makes no goddamn sense, and it happens throughout this game's narrative. You might think I hate this game's story by the sound of my complaints. That's not entirely true, but I would be lying to you if I said I had a good time with this one. I didn't like most of the characters. I thought there were too many logical inconsistencies with the writing, and worst of all, a lot of what was going on was simply boring. Yeah, there is some cool meta concepts, and fuck, that moment with Ruben dying was honestly something I don't think I'll ever forget. Everything else, though, can't say I'm a fan. So how is the actual game part of Minecraft Story Mode? Well, when you take one of the most open sandbox games ever seen up to that point and apply that to a formula of a game that is so restricted that some even hesitate to call them a game, what exactly do you get? The gameplay for Minecraft Story Mode is very familiar for anyone who's played any of Telltale's other titles. The game is broken down into an episodic nature, with each episode lasting roughly an hour and a half or so. I like this format because, if I'm being honest with you, it makes moderating these play sessions super doable, since I honestly don't find actually playing this game to be all that interesting. Alright, the gameplay itself is broken down into four main sections. Explorative segments, quick time events, conversation trees, and decision making. Let's just go right down the list. First, the exploration segments. I think these might be my favorite bits of gameplay, since these probably have the most actually going on with them. So occasionally you'll be dropped in these areas where you are free to move around and interact with various characters and objects. Well, maybe saying free is a bit of an exaggeration, let me explain. You are pretty much locked into these rooms to walk around in. Emphasis on walk because your default movement speed is abysmally slow, and in some areas like this maze, it can be a bit of a slog. Some of these rooms you explore are a bit more expansive than others, featuring multiple camera angles like a classic Resident Evil game. This can be a little disorienting when they switch between different perspectives, as your directional controls do alter, but it's something you can get used to as you play. Now what you do in these areas usually involves figuring out a problem of some sort, going back and forth with talking to NPCs, solving a puzzle, or gathering items to use in the game's crafting system. Problem with these things though, the NPCs usually don't amount to much, the puzzles are some of the easiest you'll ever experience, and the inventory and crafting system is basically brain dead. The NPCs you can talk to in these sections rarely have anything useful to say and are really just there for more flavor text and discussion. The puzzles are a bit of a mixed bag. Some of them aren't that bad, like selecting the items in order based off of a story that another NPC tells you, but some of the other ones are incredibly simple, which becomes even worse when Jesse just blurts out the answers before even giving the players a chance to guess. Finally, the the crafting system is taken from Minecraft, which sounds interesting in practice when applying that to a point-and-click style adventure game, however, this game really does not capitalize on that idea. You get materials as you explore, but only the one the game allows you to get as opposed to Minecraft where anything is possible. Even when you get these materials, you are limited to what you can actually make with them based off of what the situation is asking for. And even beyond that, you can only use these items in contextual situations. It's not like an old school style point and click game where you need to think about what items you have to find a solution to your problems. The game will just pretty much do that for you. I don't think these segments are necessarily bad. They're honestly the highlight of the gameplay sections for me. I just think that compared to other games in the genre, they're a bit more restrictive than I'd like. The next of these gameplay sections are the quick time events. These are pretty standard run of the mill QTEs, and you probably have seen these before if you've ever played God of War or Resident Evil 4. 
Buttons come on the screen, you hit it and move on. Or be like me and purposely mess up to see what happens. Usually nothing. There are some variations with the QTE, such as occasional sections where you're steering Jesse through avoid obstacles, moving through a particular area, or during some of the more in-depth combat sections. The obstacles that Jesse has to avoid are pretty simple, though the fixed perspective causes me to fail a couple of these more times than I really should have. There are some times that you'll take control of Jesse as he moves to an area which is completely on rails. I didn't know whether to talk about this here or my last point, but these sections are either completely pointless or a massive waste of potential. Look at a couple of these examples. Here's a break in a cutscene for Jesse to walk up some stairs. That's it. Here is Jesse climbing a ladder. What a thrill. With darkness and silence through the night. What a thrill. That's it. Here is Jesse walking through a field of Endermen trying not to die. That's it. Fuck, you can't even fail this section. How cool would it have been if the Enderman responded to where your cursor was on screen, so you had to move forward while also keeping your cursor away from their eyes? That would actually be a really interesting, intense gameplay situation, but instead you just walk forward without the risk of failure. Now this is gameplay. The combat segments are the things that save the QTEs the most. You can sometimes swap between a sword and a bow, and you are in this fencing-like section that is honestly kind of fun. The next gameplay section is the dialogue trees. They don't matter one bit. Yeah, I'm what not going to mince words on this one. Whispering. Outside of adding some different flavor, I, I, I don't think these dialogue choices matter at terrible. all. You essentially have four dialogue options given any circumstance that you have to choose within a time limit. Now, these aren't your standard good, neutral, or evil options you might expect for some games, but instead are always context sensitive, and they essentially all accomplish or say the same thing. Well, except for choosing the silence option, which I have to admit I did on a number of occasions just for a laugh. There really is just something funny about the game prompting you to give a speech and you just stand up there and make some weird faces like a dumbass. You still get the messages in the top corner that said, this character will remember that. So what does that amount to? Slightly different dialogue, which is better than nothing, but not something that would ever make me want to replay this game to experience. There are, however, some options that affect the story to a greater extent, and that is the last gameplay segment, the decision making. Each episode will offer a number of decisions that the player will need to make in order to ultimately decide how to shape the plot. These decisions usually give the player two to five choices, which can alter different parts of the story for the player experience. Uh, somewhat. So a lot of these decisions, again, don't really have that big of an impact. Now to be fair, there are a lot better than the dialogue trees. There are some decisions that are super small that only affect cosmetic things, like the weapon you want to craft in episode 4, or whether or not Ruben gets a black eye in episode 1. Some of the other ones are a bit more pivotal. Which one of the legendary heroes are you going after? Which one of your friends are you saving? And who you ultimately decide lives or dies between two characters. Those are some of the larger decisions. Except, it still doesn't amount to that much. If you choose to go after one legendary hero over the other, one of Jesse's friends will just get the other one for you, with the only difference being that they'll be slightly offended you didn't choose to go for them first. No matter who you say between Petra and Gabriel in Chapter 1, their events basically trade places but their fates remain the same. And regardless if you let Magnus or Elgard die, you don't see either of them again after Chapter 4, so that decision really means fuck all. Some decisions are basically asking, do you want to experience this gameplay section or not? With the likes of going down in the basement to save Lucas in Chapter 1, offering to help build the command block in Chapter 2, or entering the Witch's Hut in Chapter 4. It also almost seems like these decisions, minus a few exceptions, don't affect much of anything outside of the episodes that they're in. And I'm not going to say that The Walking Dead or The Wolf Among Us gave you a billion different outcomes or anything, but those games at least made you feel like what you were choosing actually mattered to some extent. If you want to go back and re-experience a prior episode and make new decisions, you thankfully have the ability to rewind not only a previous episode, but to a specific chapter in that episode too. This is kind of a double-edged sword though, because when you go back to that section, it means it reverts your progress back to that section of the game and you need to play through everything again. So you might as well just do two separate playthroughs if you really want to see everything. I wouldn't recommend it though. Just look up the alternate cutscenes on YouTube. There used to be a menu at the end of every episode that showed what percentage of players made what decision. But now that the game is delisted, the only way to find this information is by looking up on an archival post on the wiki. 
and even that doesn't have everything from every chapter. This game just feels like no matter what choices you make, they're completely forgotten about within an hour, which really starts to bring down this game's story, which I've already said I'm not super crazy about. I think I spent a good portion of this time really kind of thrashing this game, but I want to make something very clear. I don't hate this game, or even think it's that bad. I don't like it either if I haven't made that clear enough. I just think this game is extremely flawed in a number of different areas, and it doesn't surprise me to see that this game is often cited as the beginning of the end for Telltale as a studio. A lot of the stuff that I loved about Telltale's other games just simply isn't here, and a lot of the stuff that I love about Minecraft is also nowhere to be seen. What's left in my opinion is a mismatch of ideas that simply doesn't work. This game shows promise in a couple of areas, such as its understanding of the Minecraft community, but it also fails to see one of the most important aspects of the people who love Minecraft, the openness. That all being said, I do think it's still a shame to see this game not being available on any storefront. You're not necessarily missing out on anything by not playing this, but as someone who believes that game preservation is something that should be taken seriously, I would really like to see Telltale and Mojang work something out to bring this back. Check it out if you're very, very curious. I wouldn't seek out a physical copy unless you're a diehard fan, but hey, maybe watch the game on YouTube, or even give this video a replay if you want to experience it again. That's all the time I have for you guys today, so thank you for watching. What was your favorite memory of Minecraft Story Mode? Please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below, and hey, if you enjoyed today's video, maybe consider giving a like and subscribing. Thank you guys again, I'll catch you in the next video.